Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi there, it's Dr. Gemma, and welcome to episode 187 of the new series of the Cognitive Podcast. And I'm recording for you here on a sunny Sunday evening. It is June 16th, 2024, and it is about 7.42 p.m. And we have a smoky evening out there in the valley, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but we're not in any imminent danger for those of you who are wondering. Mind you, you're not going to hear this for another six days, but still, thank you for wondering. Your comments, by the way, are very welcome. You can comment on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. Don't forget the K in the middle of cognitive. Or you can comment on our group on Ravelry. In the warm thanks department, I wanted to thank Julie W. for her kind note on Instagram. She apparently heard me talking about her experiences when I was using the strategy, slow is better than couch. And I must say, I was admiring her because I still do. Because she looks terrific. She is achieving her goal. And she is working her way to better and better things in terms of fitness and strength. And that's all you get, guys. Nobody starts out at the finish line. Everybody starts out in the beginning. So I'm glad to hear from you, Julie. And I'm also glad to know you're still along for the ride, even though we are not in the Prius of love as we once were. Meanwhile... Karen R.S., I wanted to comment on the fact that you are out there woobling with me. Thank you so much. And Karen made the very useful comment that sometimes the instructions on the woobles are not as consistent as they could be. Yes, that is very, very true. You know, you, you sort of have to figure this out when you crochet anyway, so maybe this is a good enough thing. But, you know, the crochet instructions on the eighth day, nobody sort of determined, hey, and by the way, when you knit or crochet, the instructions are all going to be consistent. So you really do have to learn as part of our crafts how to read instructions and how to work your way through them. The woobles are not always written in a way I recognize, to be honest, but I follow that designer's logic. It's working for her. And usually you just do the math on each row and check to make sure that what she's telling you to do makes sense before you do it. And, you know, this is why knitting patterns always say read the whole pattern before you start. That you want to read it and see, can you make sense of it? Are you going to be able to do it? And there are moments where I just say, I'll figure it out when I get there. But woobles are very small projects, relatively speaking. And they can be very confusing at times. And that's all I'm going to say, I guess. Except to say, if you can wooble, if you can make a wooble, you pretty much can make cardigans, socks, or anything else. Amigurumi, despite the claims of the woobles company, is not the easiest way to crochet. What works nicely is these are small projects. So if you screw them up, you can restart them. But I don't think it's a fair thing to new crocheters to pretend that woobling is actually a real easy form of crochet. Some of them, the bee, the penguin, the chick, I might argue the cat, but I hacked that one and didn't use all the instructions. You know, the very basic egg-shaped ones can be easy, but I've got 15 years of crochet experience, and my first one was Felix the Fox, and I found him a bit challenging, not for the crocheting, but for all the detail work to get him to come together. There's a lot of embroidery on woobles, and there's a lot of sewing on of parts. I think these are great skills to have in the knitting and crocheting world. I think these really 
explosively expand your ability to do other types of things. For example, making Felix the Fox was more than enough training, with the exception of double crochet stitch. But frankly, I could have made the lakeside cardigan after I made Felix just by learning the double stitch in crochet, which is pretty easy, you know, mindlessly easy compared to the skills in Felix the Fox, like the embroidery, like attaching three-dimensional pieces to each other, and like color changing. All of those are more complicated than just learning one new crochet stitch, as straightforward as a double crochet. So Karen, hang in there and keep on woobling. And yes, I'm having a lot of fun, and I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I'm going to tell you CFR 10, CFRX, Cognitive Fiber Retreat 10, Cognitive Fiber Retreat 2024. Soon I will give it a consistent name. I'm sure I will. All the information, the link, is right there at the top of the show notes under Warm Thanks, and then you will see Cognitive Fiber Retreat in red. And there is a link, and we'll take you to our info thread on Ravelry. I do think it's important, since we're in the second half of June, to remind you that the sign-up dates are coming, July 1st, 2024. If you have ever attended a CFR, you are automatically there as long as you let me know you want a space. That is good for the month of July. After that, on August 1st, we start admitting the new people. I want you to know this sounds more scary than it is. First off, we have never, never, never blocked anybody out of a CFR. We have had a few people who behaved badly and they were politely uninvited, but unless you've heard something like that from me, which takes an awful lot, and I'm not going to give you examples because you'll be stunned, but you know, if you've attended and you haven't been uninvited, yes, you are in that first group July 1st, so please tell me. And you're going to do that by contacting me through PayPal and you're going to tell me which ones you went to. But if you are new, starting August 1st, you have equal rights to sign up. Okay, now the cost, I believe we're, I have to look at the notes. I think we're paying somewhere between six and 700 for the conference room. So what I would like, I'm going to charge 30 bucks. I don't have to pay for my room this year. I have a really good deal there. I have points. So you don't have to pay for my room. So I thought, okay. And I thought, well, why not make it 20 or 25? And the answer is, I've got to make sure we have enough to cover that conference room. That is my biggest concern, that we need the conference room. We need the place for the vendors to set up. So what I'm looking at is, I'm worried we won't get 50 people. Last year, we were a little short. I can't remember the number we did have, but I could look it up, probably like 45 or something. So I want to make sure we don't come short on that cost. And I haven't done the math well. So what I'm going to say is between now and July 1st, hopefully I will sit down and look this, look up the contract, look up the math and all that. But right now I'm tentatively saying 30 bucks a person. I may do partial refunds from that if we can afford to do that. I'd be happy to do that. However, any extra, since we are a nonprofit, any extra money we make does go into something in the event. So one other option is we all pay 30, but if everybody brings a mother bear, we can afford to send them to mother bear. We can ship them right from CFR and we can pay, I think it's $3 per bear that you pay to send a bear to mother bear. And this does remind me to say, if you knit or crochet a bear for mother bear project and you bring it and it must be finished at the time you sign in on Saturday morning, if you bring us a finished bear that is mother bear worthy, we will give you an extra raffle ticket. The raffles, you know, we get prizes from various vendors and from people I'm going to hit up on Etsy. Okay. Meanwhile, the hotel information is right there, the link for booking with our retreat rate. And you can get all that. And then again, at the bottom of the show notes under calendar, again, there will be the link for information for this because I really want to make sure you get it. In the meantime, I did go in and update the information thread with everything I have. And I did say that we have a couple different group knitting patterns and projects possible. Now, you know, last year we were all doing the Abbas Cal and 
I have to go dig that out because I'm happy to put that back in because we're going to have a mini skein exchange, which means you may want to use up those mini skeins. So that's one thing we could be doing. The other thing is the beautiful bag that our own Carmen, who came last year and is coming this year, I hope, that cross body bag that Carmen makes. That is really a classic in crochet. And all it is is four granny squares sewed together. And then you put a strap on it. And all of this is easy to do. You can completely do this sewing together with yarn. You don't need any hardware. However, our own Carmen has given us links to YouTube tutorials that tell you how to do the lining, that tell you how to do a special Tunisian crochet stitch to attach hardware. And hopefully, our own Ariane is coming and she's going to teach a class on this. But I will try to dig up all the links. What I did put in the show notes, there is a link for the free basic granny square pattern from Pearl Soho. This is a unbelievably easy, easy pattern to do. And you only need to make four of them. I can make one of these somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes. So in other words, I can have the body for this purse with no strap easily in an evening with the strap, maybe a little longer than that. Now, the other thing we can do is we can wooble. There are two free wooble patterns available put out by the designer. And all it takes is worsted weight yarn and a G hook. And now, and by the way, for the granny square, I use an I hook. The G is a 4.0 and I think the I is a 5.5 millimeter. Okay. So you can follow links in the show notes and find all this information. So you don't need to get it. If you're frantically taking notes right now, take a deep breath and relax. I did put links up in the show notes for the free basic granny square pattern from Pearl Soho and also the basic penguin or the basic chick that are free from the woobles. So if you want to play either of these games or if you want to just go back to doing the Abbas cowls, which I love in the sock yarn, please remember we will be trading mini skeins. We also will have a table of yarn donations. So essentially, if you show up with a crochet hook and you go to that table of free yarn, you're pretty much going to make something <laughs> while we're all together. So there's a few options there. But since I'm talking about woobling, I thought you might want to try it. No pressure on any of this. You can bring your own stuff and just knit on your own stuff or crochet on your own stuff. So what, meanwhile, is on my hooks and needles? Well, the Woobles had a good week because I'd started a whole bunch last week and didn't finish them. So this week I was finishing Woobles daily. That's why there's going to be a lot of them. Also, I wanted to get through my kits. I realized I had a few Woobles kits and I don't need Woobles kits anymore. I've pretty much... I think, gotten what I'm going to get out of their kits. And that's good, because if you buy them without a hook, the minimum is going to be $25. There is an exception. They make little teeny woobles, like the Hedwig that goes with Harry Potter. She's 7 bucks. Now, I don't think I'm going to pay anybody. $25 to $40, I think, are their single kits. I'm not paying that for patterns, because that's all I need. I don't need the hook. I don't need any of the supplies. I just need the pattern, because I'm up to my knees in acrylic yarn. I can make these things myself. I've got 15 years of crochet experience. If you are a beginner, I do recommend you buy at least one kit because she will teach you. She's got excellent videos. She's also got free videos on YouTube. I'm just saying. All right. Having said all that, I am sort of working my way through my kits. So here we have Billy the Unicorn. I finished him first. I like Billy. There's a good hack out there to put a mouth and nostrils on him. I'm seriously considering it, so he is living on the desk of completeness while I consider this. I did not like doing his body, but I have to admit I was very intimidated by Billy. He's got some funky looking pieces there. That's one of the reasons I bought him. I'm not a big unicorn fan. However, I did buy, as a, well, I got him for free, the angel wings from the Woobles. They were a bonus add-on. And I look at Billy and I say, you know, if you put angel wings on him, he's Pegasus. So there's another Billy in my future. I also want to experiment with his facial shape just a bit. I think he might do perfectly well with just the dragon body. But I know the designer didn't do that for a reason, and I wonder. Billy's body shape is based on Fred the Dinosaur's body. 
He's got an extra two rows, but it is pretty much the same strategy. So why do Billy? It's the funky mane and forelock. When I did the Wednesday Adams doll, her hair was roughly similar to the forelock on Billy. And I really wanted to do one of those again. And so that is what drove me to Billy. The mane on Billy looks very intimidating. It's not. It's actually pretty easy to do. Same with the ears. The horn I did not like. I may not have done it properly. I really do wonder. But also, I wanted a big, long horn. And so I hacked my own. But the horn seems perfectly good. I say this because I've seen other people's billies and their horns look fine. I just wanted this big, long... Yeah, anyway. Then there was Ralph the Reindeer. I was at Joanne's and I just went on a rescue mission. They had Ralph the Reindeer and there's also a moose whose name I don't remember. Ralph and the moose are the same pattern. They are really the same. The only difference, you rotate the antlers 180 degrees to make one into the other. And the snout. Ralph has a snout very similar. In fact, it may be the same as Felix the fox. Although you do his nose on the snout when you embroider it just a little differently, but it's no big challenge here. The moose has a snout that is more like Gertrude the unicorn. It is the oval snout from the book. And you can find it. I'm sure there are patterns in there with the oval snout, although I can't remember which. I do not like the snout on the moose. Uh, it's the snout on Bacon the pig. And every time I look at that moose, I just see a pig in dark brown with antlers. So I don't think I'm going to do the moose unless I come up with a good hack. But I quite like Ralph the reindeer. I think if you run a string through the back of Ralph, he would make a great Christmas tree ornament. So I liked Ralph a lot. I enjoyed doing him, but I really do like the basic egg-shaped wobble. Ralph has a few extra things on him, an add-on snout, embroidery. I like him. There's a lot of useful skills there in, in Ralph. I like those ears. Those are the same ears as on bears, like Lola the... I think she's Lola Loca now, but Lola the polar bear and Walter the teddy bear. By the way, Walter was a Walmart special. He was a collaboration with Walmart, and I believe they no longer carry him. He's a little harder to get. Meanwhile, I finished Tanya the Tigress. Now we're getting into my hacks. Tanya's just a hack. I used the body shape and the snout of Boom the Otter from the book. I used the ears of Felix the Fox, and they are exactly the same as far as I can tell. And I used the chest spot, I believe, of Pierre the penguin. And then I, the tail, what did I do? I hacked the tail. The tail's just straight. You do a magic circle of six stitches in the circle, and then you just keep going round and round in six, and you stripe it. And so she's a total hack. I did put her on a Reddit group, and everybody looked at her and said, that's a hack? You made that up? It looks just like it. I also took pictures from the Woobles website of the kit to place the stripes on it. I have to tell you, the great thing about Tanya, she really comes to life when you put those stripes on her. And that's probably true of the cat pattern, which is called Nico. I don't have Nico. I did not buy the kit. But I hacked it, frankly, to make the, my Minerva Wooble, which I can't tell if I've shown you. No, I've already shown you Minerva last week. Okay. And then there were the donuts. I swore I'd never do the donuts. I thought they were insanely stupid. However, I got the kit for Joe the coffee mug, which I thought was adorbs. And I wanted to try to work out how she makes the coffee mug shape. Because it's a circle at the bottom, and then she makes it go upwards. And I knew that was through the back of the front loops, but I didn't know which. Anyway, I got it on the cheap, and I decided to take it. So, if you're going to make coffee, you got to make donuts. The donut is hacked. <laughs> I'm just going to go that far. How did I get the donut body? Somebody gave me something that was close enough. Let's put it that way. And then I looked at pictures and hacked. I had to really search the Woobles groups on Facebook to see a finished one and to kind of get a sense of what I was doing. So there is their frosted donut. And the frosted donut, you can add more icing, which is just stripes in straight lines across it. Or you can add sprinkles, as you can see. Frosty got sprinkles. I quite like Frosty. I did not at first. It is very hard to get the tension right on something this shape without stretching the holes between the stitches. So be warned if you did that. And that's one reason I like the sprinkles, because I've covered a lot of those holes. <laughs> so there's Frosty the Donut. 
And then I went back to the book and I straight up from the book made Clint the Cactus. He was a Father's Day gift today for my beloved hubs, whom we celebrated today, who quite likes him. He likes cacti anyway. He likes succulent plants. So I thought it would be really cool. He also likes things that have tiny little eyes and big smiles. So Clint was tailor-made. If you're going to wooble hack, that basket is a winner. See that basket he's sitting in? That's a separate piece. I would really recommend you get that out of the book. You can make that and use it as an Easter basket or as a stand for any of the other woobles. Changing the colors on it would be very easy, obviously. A variegated yarn would make that basket look really cool. So that basket is one of the great pieces of wooble book lore that I recommend you get a hold of because that's a really useful piece. And of course, Clint is just the basic egg-shaped body. So you could hack him, you could make him up if you wanted to. He has a little pink flower on his head there and we love him. And then there was a kit, Hedwig the Owl. Okay, this kit's worth the money, it's $7. You know, you don't get a whole lot, you get the yarn you need and you get good instructions. But you know, considering the cost of yarn and everything else, yeah, I actually think these little mini kits that they put out are probably worth their price. Will they teach you how to crochet? No. She says that. She says she doesn't recommend that you get the minis if you're a beginner. But if you're seasoned and you want a little cheap toy and you feel like buying something at Joann's or whatever, yeah, these, I don't actually know if they sell them anywhere or if you have to order them. But if you feel like a treat for yourself and you, you know, don't mind paying shipping that costs more than the treat for yourself. Anyway, buy enough, you get free shipping. Buy them with your knitting group or your crocheting group. Everybody get together, say we're going to buy a bunch of these and we'll make one order and we'll get free shipping. But I think she was worth it. I quite like her. She's very good looking. I don't know if the photo does her justice because it's hard to see that she's got gray feathers on her chest. But I quite enjoyed her. And there's Joe, the Woobles mug. Joe, not hard. <laughs> really easy. In fact, I think I just made all the pieces in one night and then took a couple nights to assemble. But there is nothing hard about Joe, the Woobles mug. He is definitely a beginner project and very, very enjoyable. He's as simple to make as the basic egg-shaped chick or penguin. He's just a really, really easy thing. He is there modeling with Frosty the Donut. And of course, that led me to make Drippy the Donut. Drippy has a slight change in his top piece that is in the darker color, that is the frosting, where it looks like he's dripping a little bit down the sides. I quite like Drippy and I enjoyed him. These two were sold as mystery kits. You ordered a donut and you didn't know which one you'd get and you didn't know what color yarns you would get. I have to say I think they're a piece of marketing genius. They're not hard to do but again that tension's a little bit tricky. These are not from kits. Mine are just hacked with my own yarn. However, the reason I think they're brilliant is this is a way for the Woobles people to get rid of extra bits of yarn that they need to get rid of without tossing them in a trash can. They sell them off as parts of these kits, I would assume. And I have to say, I think it's a great marketing strategy. I don't see donuts as particularly exciting projects, but they went fast. They were like two night projects. I was astonished when I went on Reddit and found how many people are in love with the donuts. Go figure. <laughs> okay, in progress, the stash toss is frozen because I'm just working my way through huge skeins of acrylic. I found a huge trove of them in a storage bin in my closet in the back bedroom. I thought I had given away all my acrylic yarn. No, I've got quite a lot of it. So I'm having fun woobling. That's one of the reasons I'm woobling. I'm also woobling because it's hot outside. And so these are really easy light projects. This is the crochet equivalent of knitting socks in the summer, you know that it's not hard to work on these. They go pretty quick and you're not carrying around a big heavy bag full of wool. So this would be it. So meanwhile, in what am I starting? Well, I started Kaida, the red Kaida, the red dragon, but I'm calling it Maria after the writer of one of my favorite dragon series. So that is Maria, the red dragon, who's actually red Kaida, the dragon. And Maria's not looking good. She has her body, which is not quite the basic egg. It's close, but it has a few extra rows. Red Kaida, or Purple Kaida, who is the basic one, they are both listed as intermediate kits. And it's because, see all those pins sticking out of poor little Maria? Yeah. Okay, if you look at the very top, you can see sort of greeny yellow ones. Those are for her horns. That's 
marking the top row where they will connect. Then there's orange ones for where her ears will connect. And then you can see green ones between her eyes where her snout will be. And then you can see yellowy green ones where her tummy will be. Oh no, there's more. There's a tail in the back and there's scales down the back. The scales are not the same strategy as the ones on Fred the dinosaur. I think they may have originally been modeled on it. I suspect that these scales are a little more sophisticated and probably somewhat in response to complaints about how challenging those dinosaur scales are for beginners. But Maria is clearly, well, Kaida, to call her by her Wubble's name, she is clearly an intermediate project just because you're gonna spend a lot of time making little parts and sewing them on. But I am enjoying her a lot. I am pleased to have a slightly different body shape. It's not as irregular as the dinosaur or the unicorn, so I found her fairly easy. Meanwhile, back at my crochet block experiments. Yes, I spent a happy evening hand sewing the lining in. This was very, very easy to do. I was actually editing episode 186 and I just sat and sewed. And I was very worried that somehow sewing into the yarn that I crocheted wouldn't work well. No, quite the opposite. Extremely, extremely easy to sew in that lining. That should not stop you if you wanna make one of these purses. Remember, if you're gonna make one of these purses in our class with the wonderful Ariane, remember, you only need to make four blocks and you don't need a liner. You can just use magnets that you buy at a craft store at the very top center to hold the bag shut. You can sew on the strap. You don't need a liner, you don't need a zipper, you don't need to work this hard. But I am so impressed with the bags that Carmen made last year, so of course, I had to try to teach myself. That was before I noticed that she'd actually given me a link to a YouTube on how to do these liners. Okay, I worked it out. I will be bringing with me my template to cut the pieces of the liner. I have it sitting on my desk. I'm looking at it as I squeak. I mean speak. If you're squeaking, it's my chair because I can't sit still. But anyway, if you want to do a liner for these bags and you're using six inch squares as I did, Go get yourself some fat quarters at Joanne Fabrics when they have them on sale. It's the easiest way. I just get a whole bunch of them and use them. Those are exactly the right size to cut down with my template, which I hope to bring with me. Meanwhile, the Lakeside Cardigan. I, you can tell I had a really good week with the work on this stuff. I finally got it all together, except I haven't done the two little pieces of the front I located those pieces. I have more than enough squares, I believe, to finish that. And so I really need to just lay the whole thing out on the floor and look at those last bits and pin them into place and then start sewing them together. So the Lakeside Cardigan is looking very close to a first draft. What do I mean by that? I mean everything's sewn together, but then I have to look at what I want to do with the sleeves and what I want to do with the front if I want to do any kind of ribbing. I probably do because I had a great experience doing the ribbing on my Love Hex cardigan. Really enjoyed it. Vestuary, haven't touched it. Fortunately, I'm starting to get over my wooble craze and I'm running out of kits, <laughs> so I will probably get myself back to all these projects. No spinning, so I'm going to move on to a strategy. I have to be honest, this isn't so much a strategy as a kind of awareness I came to this week, and that is FOMO, which stands for fear of missing out. I was looking into this Wooble craze, and it is crazy. I mean, there are people who have bought all the kits, which really, even with the minis included, that's a lot. That's like 150. And then they run out of kits, and so they have started making everything out of the book. Now, I like the Woobles, but I don't think most of them are that great that I've got to make them all. Of course, I'm looking at a desk full of them wondering, but anyway. I mean, sometimes I'm intellectually curious about them. The unicorn is a really good example. So is the raccoon. I just, oh yeah, so is Gertrude the llama. I just got interested in the body shapes and some of the techniques and said, why not? And Gertrude the llama is white. So, of course, she represents our late lamented llama Paz and his alpaca sister, Rash, uh, Rashida, both of whom have gone to that great alpaca and llama barn in the sky. They were very old when they went, no problems there. 
And so, you know, there's emotional attachments to things like that. But, you know, when I made the unicorn and when I made the raccoon, the raccoon, I just wanted to see if I could figure it out because I resented that it was a limited release and they weren't releasing it anymore. And of course, the day I made the body, they then announced they were re-releasing the raccoon. And I said, too late, guys. And I pieced together the raccoon a few weeks ago, just hacking, just figuring out pieces from the book and using my own yarn. The unicorn, I knew I wasn't going to guess, and I wanted that pattern, and, well, there we are. At any rate, I realized, though, what is driving me with these things? Because I've spent a lot of money on these guys, on the kits. And I realized I heard somebody say FOMO. I looked it up on that great urban dictionary called Google and realized that's what's driving this, the fear of missing out. And what cured it? The sense that I'm not. How did I get that sense? I went on Reddit. And I don't want to go into this too deeply, but basically I found everything I didn't have that allows me to make all of these things if I want to. And the minute I did that, my interest really sagged. Now, it hasn't gone away because there's another thing you get from these little projects, and that is the satisfaction of completing something easily. But I look at the Woobles and I think, first of all, it's t-shirt yarn basically. And it's a perfectly good yarn. And it's a really good yarn if you're a noob. It's a great way to learn how to crochet because you can't stick your hook through it very easily. So your hook always goes to the right place, comes out a hole where it should come out as long as you aim properly. But you know, that yarn makes some of these rather less attractive than they would be in a good old fashioned plied yarn, a cheap acrylic. And so, you know, I don't always think these are as attractive as they could be because of that base yarn. And I thought, well, why am I making so many of them? And I thought, I got hit with the FOMO, the fear of missing out. FOMO is a very powerful thing. I think it is why you have things like team logos, team shirts, whatever, that you feel like you're part of the in group. You feel like you've joined. The easiest example in our current culture, and I beg forgiveness, I don't mean to insult anybody, but the MAGA hats, the red hats, is that when you wear the MAGA hat, you're now in with the in crowd in a certain group of people. I do not wear a MAGA hat, let's be honest here. But, you know, there are codes and there are tricks and there are strategies, secret handshakes, whatever, that let you be in with the in crowd. You know, I was in a Greek organization in college we had secret sayings and we had a dress code for our meetings and we had special songs, all of that. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It puts you in the group. And when you're in a crowd and you see something like that and you realize you don't know what it means, that's where you hit FOMO, fear of missing out. And Madison Avenue Marketing is using FOMO on us all the time. And so, you know, it's like when people talk about collecting yarn. Yes, I have a huge yarn hoard. So I am not criticizing anybody when I say this. But a lot of that was FOMO. We joke about it. I would go to Stitches West, you know, to the big yarn conferences we used to have. And they would joke about yarn fumes. All that yarn makes you crazy and you buy stuff you wouldn't buy. That's FOMO. That's a sense that everybody else sees these beautiful things and they can take them home with them and do mysterious things with them. And I'm going to join that crowd by doing it. And I did, and I have very few regrets. And that's one reason I like CFR, because I give away some of that yarn where I look at it and say, I'm never going to get to that. And they make good raffle prizes. What can I say? I'm still using it in creative ways. But a lot of these things, a lot of marketing, a lot of group activities rely on FOMO. Now, you can tell where this is going to go, can't you? Because I mentioned the MAGA hats, that sometimes FOMO creates cult-like behaviors. And that's where it gets a little bit scary, that people get sucked in and they know so much, and they feel like now, if they stop, they've lost something. And now the members of the group or the cult feel as though they can't stop, that they wasted their time and this is something we know in social and industrial psych, that once you do something unusual, you buy a certain type of car that's new or whatever, you will double down and defend it 
rather than give it up and admit that you wasted your time or you made a bad buy. That's what lemons are about when you buy a bad car and it's a lemon. You don't want to admit it. So people drive their unworking cars, their lemons, for a long time before they admit it. So FOMO leads to this kind of guilt and shame that you may have overdone it or you may have missed something if you quit or you may have wasted your time if you quit. So that's the risk of FOMO. And I had to laugh because one of the questions I get now, I have the, what I call the desk of completeness over here to my right, where all my finished woobles are gathered. I'm running out of space on the DOC, I might add. But people keep saying, but what are you going to do with them? Come on, man, I'll take them to a children's shelter and give them away. I'll give them to a teacher when we do our craft exchange here in the Santa Clarita Valley and say, here, these could be prizes for kids in your class for good behavior. One great thing about making little toys, you're always going to find a use for them. And it's interesting because I do see some of the Woobles groupies who have shelves full of finished Woobles saying, look at my collection. And I think, no, I don't really feel the need to do that. Do I feel attached to the Woobles? Yes, a few of them. I am fond of the black cat I made for Minerva. Obviously, I'm fond of Gertrude the Llama, although she was not a perfect build because of my late Llama Paws and my late Alpaca Rashida. I have a few strange fondnesses here and there, but mostly I think, you know, okay, the Hedwig and the reindeer, you know, those guys will go on the Christmas tree. What's going to happen to my dragon? When I have had enough of her, I'll probably send her to the author she's named after if I can get an address to do that. So, you know, there's always a place to move these things along. We keep these things for a while and they give us a certain happiness, but hopefully we're healthy enough to get rid of them eventually if they're clogging our lives. FOMO is where you can't do that. The fear of missing out and then the fear that you've wasted your time or the fear that you're somehow too invested. That's what you got to watch out for. FOMO can be used against you in all sorts of odd ways. For example, billboards use FOMO all the time. There was a game at McDonald's for years, a Monopoly game, where people went crazy collecting those pieces. That's all FOMO stuff. But what if I went to McDonald's today and I got that one rare piece? Yeah, I know. And then you would win a million dollars. How many people won a million dollars? You know, probably one or two. Your chances are probably better of getting hit by lightning, frankly. It's the lotteries in most states. They're playing on FOMO. So that's the whole thing, is that fear of missing out. And so I guess the strategy is... You want to think very carefully about your FOMO moments. And you want to think about, can I part with some of these things or these habits? And I think that's where you get, you could argue that's where you get compulsive reading of groups like Instagram or Reddit or whatever, Discord, whatever. So that is fear of missing out. Don't do it. There we go. Or rather, what you want to do instead is you want to focus your life towards experience, not towards objects. A lot of FOMO is based on objects like the Woobles or the MAGA hat or whatever. Now, what I find amazing is experiences can also be made into FOMO. There's the I have to go to every national park FOMO. However, I have to tell you, if you're going to national parks, I think you're actually collecting some pretty good things. If you bring back some souvenir, like an inexpensive thing, like a patch that you can sew onto your backpack or whatever. When I was traveling in Europe in the 80s, that's what I did. In every country, I picked up a little patch. They cost under a dollar in those days, and I sewed them onto my backpack. And when I got into the airport in Soviet Russia, the Soviet baggage handlers stole them. They cut them all off my backpack, holding us all up for like three hours while they were tearing them and finding ways to disconnect them from my backpack. All I got to tell you is that's one of the saddest things I've ever encountered. I felt sad about it, but I felt even worse for the people whose lives were that narrow. So FOMO, I didn't have it for the backpack patches when I realized there was a sadder story there. But don't let yourself get trapped in it. Ah, uh, shoot, I've been running and cycling. I think my bike desk is now at 450 miles since late November. And I've been running. I'm in week three. However, we got hit by a heat wave, so I have had to bike this week. Uh, oh, I need to run. I really need to run. And it's thrown me off. I'm sleeping late, staying up late, all sorts of messy things. In the fluffy books, not much going on there. 
I am finally watching the last half of season three of Bridgerton. Episodes one through four, the first half, I liked considerably better than five through eight. I think they're dragging out the suspense a bit much. Also, yeah, what they do to the second brother, Benedict. As a 21st century woman, I don't mind it. But I have to tell you, that would never go in the Regency. That would be unacceptable. Benedict would probably get away with it. But the woman involved would just be considered social poison for that. Uh, it's unbelievable that she would be able to get away with it. She says, oh, my servants are discreet. Oh, that is a lot of faith in your servants. You'd better be paying them pretty well or you'd be getting blackmail. Just saying. However, I'm enjoying Bridgerton. What can I say? Something I really like, the road ID. I have said this before. You can see a picture of mine. It's faced away from the camera because I don't want you to see all my private information. But you can see it's just a purple band, silicon band, this one. This is their cheapest model with a metal tag that wraps around it. Very easy to attach. Once again, road ID people did a great job. The engraving is perfect. I've got five lines. It's not easy stuff because it's about what medications I can and cannot tolerate. And they did a perfect job. No typos, nothing. This, I think, is one of the most valuable things you can have if you are exercising out on your own, if you're riding your bike out in the wilderness, or if you're running or hiking, you really, really want to have one of these guys. This is the simple, low-tech way to be identified if you need help. I have put a discount link in the show notes right above the picture there. It says Road ID discount link. You will get a discount if you use it. I suspect I will too, but how many of these things do you think I need? However, I did buy two sets of bands, red and purple, and then I just bought one nice tag on it. I may spring for another tag so I can wear my red band from time to time. I was worried that this would break. When you buy these, you measure your wrist and they give you the measurements and all that. I bought the men's large, I think, because I wanted to make sure I have big hands, wide hands. I want to make sure it got over my hand. The interesting thing is they sent me all three, the men's small, medium, and large, because silicon bands aren't exactly expensive, you know? And then they sent me my beautiful engraved plate. So I have two sets of these in red and purple, and I have my engraved plate. I have used Road ID for oh, easily 20 years. I know I was wearing one when I was marathoning in 2003. It's probably in the picture, in fact. And no, that might be a little bit soon. I think they were saying they were 17 years old. No, it's not in the picture. So no, I would have been wearing it. But it was marathoning. No, wait. I am wearing it. I am wearing it in the Rock and Roll Marathon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it on. Yes, I have it on. There we go. All those pictures. Okay, I was wearing something of an ID. At any rate, you want one of these. This is just a great idea. You can also put this on an elderly person if you're worrying about them getting lost or hurt and losing contact with you. Put it on your kids. Put it on your pets. They have a collar for dogs version. Did I say that right? They have a version for your dog's collar. They have one that attaches to the watch band of your iWatch. I just think these things are so worth the price. I think it's a safety issue, and I'm even giving you the discount code. So I think you get like 10% off. Put a lid on it. Nothing going there. Nothing new there. Blather, jewelry duty, ugh, June 24th. So I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to take to crochet. I think woobles sound really obvious but I don't want to carry all the Wooble stuff, like, you know, the stuffing and the eyes and all that stuff. So I'm likely just to make either granny squares, or I might go with the Abbas cow, but again, I don't want to carry all those little bits and pieces. We'll see. We'll see what I make. I, usually I just make an easy, easy shawl, and I may do that. I haven't weighed myself in a few weeks, to be honest, although I feel great, and I, last time I checked, I was down 24 pounds. I hope more than that now, but I'm not really worrying about it because I'm building muscle by biking and running. Project Cookbook drags on. Let's see if I got anything new to say here. Oh, yes, the fire. We're on fire. No, we're not. The fire is called 
what is it called? It's called the post fire. And I believe I estimated it's about 26 or 27 miles to the northwest of us. There's a lot of smoke everywhere, but the more scary thing is we're getting big winds in the next few days. So that is going to bring it uncomfortably closer to us. So we do have our evac plan in case we need to. And you can imagine that that's going to lead to me saying smugly, evacuation for me, once we get the pets and the family out, I'm really happy. That's just my purse. And oh my gosh, one of my computers basically and my phone and the house keys. Everything else, the house isn't going to burn. My husband's been getting rid of all the weeds and stuff. Smoke damage would be a possibility. But otherwise, because I did all that work, backing up and destroying files and everything else, frankly, I feel really smug and this is why you buy insurance, isn't it? So there we go. But I'm not really thinking this is terribly likely. By the time you hear this, you'll probably have heard if it happened or not. But please don't lose sleep. We're not particularly worried. And this is because I owe an enormous debt to my boys for all the weed destruction around the building that they've been doing. In the meantime, all the resources that I use, that I talk about, there are links to all of them in the show notes. The gathering of most of them is near the bottom of the show notes. It's called Community Resources. I've got links to the pattern books I've liked for knitting and crocheting. I've got links to the things I've bought to support knitting and crochet, and then a list of links of skills and techniques. On the calendar in the first section of that, you can see all the information local to the Santa Clarita Valley and including all the groups that are related to crafting that I know of. And you can find them all on Facebook, which is why I don't have links to them. They are Facebook groups. My calendar personally, I'm hanging in for July 4th, kids. Well, actually, I'm hanging in for jury duty, which is next week. Because, you know, worst comes to worst, I'm going to get a few mornings off. I may get a few days off. We'll see. I'm not usually called. Nobody wants a psychologist on a jury. But that will be the week of the 24th. Then after that, we have the July 4th holiday. I have a four-day weekend coming up. Labor Day, hooray. I've got five days there through my birthday on September 4th. And then, of course, we have the CFR 10 information yet again. And that, of course, will be at the Courtyard by Marriott in Valencia on September 28th. But, of course, for me and for some of us, the party starts on the 27th and will end at the brunch on the 29th, where we break down anything we need to say to each other and we work out the details for CFR 11. Romeo, December 21st through January 1st. And that's that, except to say Minerva gets the last word. I could not resist the Tatooine photo again. Because, again, we are trapped on Tatooine. It's very hot. You can see Minerva there lying on the back of my love seat, And she is observing our two sons as she looks out on the desert. Just like Luke Skywalker, except in a black fur coat in the desert. Makes no sense, but that's life. But Minerva wants you to know we are okay. Here in the smoke and the haze and the heat, we're all hanging in. And we all know what we have to do if we have to evac. But we've been here 20-something years, and we... Really haven't had to. The only risk has been me for my asthma, and frankly, the air conditioning is working great. So no problems and no worries. We had a lovely Father's Day, which involved us all wearing shirts, stating a version of my husband's favorite recent thing. He kept walking around saying, I'm not bothered, which is based on a British comedy routine. So I found these t-shirts. They have Winnie the Pooh skipping on them and it says zero bothers given. So all three of us wore our zero bothers given shirt today. My husband got some lovely Father's Day gifts and cards including Clint the Cactus from the Woobles. So we had a lovely lovely time and so being trapped on Tatooine Minerva wants you to know it's okay. We're all here together and so far we're safe and sound. And on that note please everybody remember we are a community. When you support the community, you are supporting yourself and your own individual rights. And when you act that way, everybody benefits. So please, everybody, take care of each other. 
get your shots, take care of your illnesses and all that sort of thing. Do it for yourself, do it for your family, do it for your community. Please, if you're coming to CFR 10, do it for us, get all those vaccines. All right. But in the meantime, everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.